Christian Broadcast Ministries presents CBM Worship. We invite you to worship with us as we praise and worship our Lord together through music, prayer, and God's Word. We bring you CBM Worship from the Sanctuary of the Wayside Temple, 3809 Maple Avenue in Castalia, Ohio. We pray you'll be blessed and encouraged as we worship our Lord together. our special music to prepare at this time. Well, we are blessed people today, and it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Week from the day, I believe I've got it right, week from today is Mother's Day. And we always look forward to honoring our moms and our ladies on Mother's Day. So if the Lord wills and P. Terry's is coming, we're able to gather. We're going to be doing that again this year. And uh, we just pray that all of our moms and ladies have a wonderful day on Mom's Day. Now, I like to just plant a little, 
uh, encouragement in the hearts and minds of moms and grandmoms. Look, you use the day to your advantage. And you bring, bring, bring people to the house of God that might not ordinarily come, but they'll do it for mom on mom's day. Uh, we love folks. We want to help our loved ones, our friends to come to know Christ. So if they don't know the Lord, why? You're, trying, you're praying for them. You're trying to win them to the Lord. Tell them they got to come with you on mom's day. And who knows, maybe, uh, you know, you got other plans and you'll get together afterwards, all that kind of thing. But uh, make the most of the day in more than one way. And I believe um, the Lord can bring some special blessings. All right, we'll look forward to that. Brother Neil, are you ready? He's all by himself. Everybody has deserted him. Brother Neil. Restless generation turning over every stone hoping to find salvation in a world that's left us cold so can we get back to the altar or to the arms of our first love there's only one way to the father and he's calling out to us to the captive it looks like freedom to the orphan it feels like home skeptic it might sound crazy to believe in a god who loves in a world where our hearts are breaking and we're lost in the mess we've made like a blinding light in the dead of night it's the gospel it's the gospel that makes a way it's the gospel
change to come Appreciate those good songs. Let's pray for a moment, shall we? Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for making a way. Often, Lord, when there seems to be no way, Lord, you are the mountain mover, the way maker. And we give you praise and glory, Lord, for your faithfulness through all of our experiences in life, Lord. You demonstrate your faithfulness. Lord, everything that comes to us is not good, but Lord, you work those things for our good, and Lord, you prove yourself again and again. Thank you, Father, for every blessing. We've heard testimonies here today of your faithfulness, answered prayer. Lord, we all have experienced at times in different seasons of our life Lord, your provision in remarkable ways. And we just want to praise you today. and Thank you for all that you've done. Most of all, we thank you for saving us that day we called upon your great name. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll help us to see our need for the gospel today. Lord, this world is a troubled place. And through it all, we need the gospel that Neil was singing about. And I just pray that 
you'll open hearts, open understanding, and help us to hear the warnings of our Savior today. Quicken your word to our hearts. This is your word. Holy Spirit, bear witness. Touch our hearts. Speak to us, Lord. Call us to the Savior. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want you to open your Bible to Matthew chapter 7, and we're going to begin there. I actually have uh, several passages in Matthew's gospel that I'd like to read, and the reading of these passages will form the very uh, substance of the message today. Um, each of these, in one way or the, or the other, have a warning from the Savior, the Lord Jesus. And I want you to listen carefully. Uh, I pray that God's word will stir our hearts as believers. I know the Holy Spirit. He understands what we need as believers. So, Lord, touch our hearts. Some perhaps seated here, maybe some watching, listening. You see, I don't know anyone's heart really, but I certainly wouldn't know the hearts of, of some who, who have come and some that are watching, listening. You've, you've never accepted Christ or perhaps you don't have assurance in your heart that you're saved and and so I want you to listen closely listen to the words of the Lord Jesus Christ we're in Matthew uh, chapter 7 and we're going to start down at verse 13 we're only going to look at two verses in this passage I, I believe we all need to think deeply about the warnings of Jesus in scripture concerning the reality of a real place of separation from God in eternity. I just want to say clearly today that uh, hell is no laughing matter, and it's not something to, uh, to be explained away. It, it's not something to joke about, and uh, it's something to be considered carefully, especially the words that fell from the lips of the Son of the living God. Our Lord Jesus speaks clearly about an eternal existence apart from God uh, in a place that is the expression of divine wrath to be experienced by all who refuse his mercy and his persistence. Uh, you know, God is very persistent. God is long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God works with our heart. And we have a need for repentance. There is a sin problem in our world today. It started a long time ago with the first man, Adam. But uh, those, the rest of the race, descended from him. We, we've all experienced the same. We have within us a fallen nature. We, um, we sin because we are sinners. And uh, we, we go astray from our mother's womb. And the truth is... We, we go astray from God, and the Bible says that there's none good, no, not one. It goes so far as to say there's none that seek after God. That's talking about in our natural condition. That's our first response. That's, that's our condition. We, we don't first seek Him. But I've got good news for you. He seeks us. You know, when Adam fell in the garden, the Bible paints a picture for us. We can imagine the joy and the fellowship that Adam enjoyed with the Lord God before sin. And uh, the Bible talks about how the voice of the Lord would come walking in the cool of the garden in the, in the evening, whatever. And, and, and Adam and the Lord would commune. They had a perfect relationship. But one day the Lord came. He, he knows all things. But you see, God deals with us on our level and and uh, he's very personal and when he come when he came that day he said Adam where art thou Adam wasn't there you know where he was at he was hiding and he was hiding in the trees of the garden he had never done that before what's going on something horrible has happened Something has come between him and the living God. Something has alienated him. Something has cut him off from the life of God. And that something was sin. Adam disobeyed God. And when he disobeyed God, sin came into the world. And with it came death. 
But you see, when Adam was hiding, God came seeking after him. Adam, where art thou? I got to tell you something. You may not understand this, but a loving God has been seeking you for a long time. And he cares about you. And while you're busy hiding yourself and running from him, he's pursuing you. And I got news for you today. The Holy Spirit will show up on your doorstep and he's going to plead with you. And the Lord Jesus is going to knock at that heart's door. He'll never push the door open. But he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man open that door, I'll come in. <laughs> He's seeking you today. He doesn't want you to be lost. He's very persistent. But if you resist the call of God, if you resist the witness of God, if you resist the work of the Holy Spirit, there will come a sad day when the Lord will say to you, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. We need to be of serious mind. I trust you'll listen closely to the words of Christ. And um, these really do provide warning for us. We start in Matthew 7, verse 13. Jesus is teaching part of this is part of the teaching of what is commonly referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. It's more towards the end of that great um, sermon. But here he comes to this topic. And Jesus says in verse 13, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You know, I've read those words many times, and I like to preach about it as often as I can. We have to warn people today. We've got good news, and we're going to get to the good news before this service is over. But I'm going to tell you something. We need to be of serious mind. There is a broad way that leads to destruction. It is wide. It's wide because there's a lot of people traveling the broad road that leads to destruction. The gate is wide. And, and, and there's relatively few in comparison. Now, the few that's spoken of here that are, that are on the narrow road that leads to life, they still form a great multitude of people. But in comparison to all the population, they're relatively few. It breaks my heart to think today that most people are traveling the wide, broad road that's leading to destruction. You say, well, Brother Russ, why is the way that leads to life narrow? Why is it so narrow. Well, there's a simple exclamation for that, and, and, and it's this reality. You see, the way that leads to eternal life is a narrow road because there's only one way. The way that leads home leads by a place called Calvary, where Christ died for the sins of the world. It leads to a place of repentance where you bow the knee and you confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and you receive him as your Lord and your Savior. That's a place of repentance, a place where you admit that God is right, you've been wrong, you have sinned, you admit it before God and you put your faith in his Son, confessing him as your Lord and Savior, your only hope of heaven. The world would tell you that there's many ways. Matter of fact, they'll tell you that all the paths lead to the same place. That's the biggest lie that you'll ever hear this side of eternity. And you better not listen to it. That's the broad road. No, there's a narrow road that leads to life. And it's narrow because there's but one door. You'll have to go through the Lord Jesus Christ. Relatively few are on that road. Can I ask you a question? Which road? Are you traveling today? Are you traveling the broad road that leads to destruction? Or on you, are you on the narrow road that leads to life? Everyone in this building at some point was traveling the wrong direction. Brother Den, quite a few years, 
he was on the wrong road. Kevin, there was a lot of years on the wrong road, drifting towards destruction. Brother Ron, there was a season, a long season there in your life when you were younger. You were not ready. You were traveling the broad road. Am I telling it right? You were headed for destruction. Brother Herman, there was a season, there was a time. You were on the broad road. Dad, aren't you glad for that day? When the Lord Jesus Christ changed our direction. Brother Corb, we're not headed on the broad road anymore. <laughs> we done changed direction. And we're traveling the road that's going to lead all the way to glory. Amen. You're on one of those two highways today. If you're on the broad road, you better listen to the Holy Spirit. He is active and he is speaking and he is calling us to himself. Turn your Bible just a few pages. We're going to stay in Matthew. We're in Matthew chapter 10. And I just want to read some scripture here. Uh, verses 5 down through 15, just for a little context. And I just want to call your attention to something that Jesus teaches in this passage. Now, uh, Matthew 10, 5, the setting is the, the 12 uh, Jesus is going to send the, them forth. He's named them previously here in these earlier verses. Then he says, These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles and into, and into any city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as ye go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers. Raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye have received, freely give. Provide neither gold, nor silver, nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet staffs, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. Now listen real close. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. Listen. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. Verily, I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. I've read these words many times. I think, Lord, what a message. Now, Jesus sent his 12. Brother Al, they're ministering under his authority in his day during his public ministry, and he's went out, preached to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. He first came to Israel. He's presenting himself as their promised Messiah. The good news is being preached. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's time to repent. It's time to believe the gospel, the Lord Jesus. Now, if you don't think things are quite serious, Christ sent these men out, and he said, when you go into that little city, that little town, if they will not receive you, and if they will not hear your words, when you leave that house or city on the way out, shake off the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. And Christ said, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Most of you know the history connected to Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities that were far from God, steeped in rebellion against God. And they were involved in debauchery and all kinds of sin, unnatural behavior. And you know about the history. And you know the Lord God rained fire and brimstone from heaven and consumed those cities when Lot and his, and his daughters and, and wife, they had been taken out of the city. You know the history. You say, they must have been pretty wicked, Brother Ross. Well, God chose to deal with them in that way at that time, and he's left that there as a testimony to those who've come after. We need to fear God. We need to turn from our wickedness. We need to turn from our sin. But hear me. If you don't repent at the preaching of this preacher, is everybody listening? If you refuse to repent 
at the preaching of this preacher. It will be more tolerable in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than it will be for you. Now, I've read that and I think, Lord, I, I got the picture. You mean for us to listen. And you mean for us to repent. You mean for us to bow the knee and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus. You mean for us to come to a humble place of repentance in our heart where we turn to you and receive Christ. And if we don't hear your word and do that, there's a day of judgment coming. And in that day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for those who had less light than you do. I don't think we're of serious mind. I just don't believe it. I don't believe the average Christian is nearly as serious as they ought to be. And I sure know the world is careless. We go on about making money. We go on about building our houses. We go on about making our our good times, and we think we're getting along good when our health is good especially, and we just got all the things of this old world. This world's just a temporal vapor. It's here for a few short years. Don't deceive yourself because you're a bit younger. Uh, I was once young. I don't feel so old, but I look at the calendar and I realize that, don't kid yourself, bud. There's things I'd have tried to have done 40 years ago that I wouldn't even think about today. No, I, I know. I know what the deal is. Life is a vapor, and it's quickly fading. Yours will too. Don't deceive yourself. The meaning of life is to know the Lord and to enjoy Him, to walk with Him. If you're living your life with no walk with God or the Lord's on the back burner and every once in a while you get convicted and you think, boy, I need to give my life to Christ. But you neglect it and you go on and you think you're getting along good in life. You're deceiving yourself. The truth is your life could end today. The days in which we live, it's very common to see 20-year-olds in the obituary column. All ages are leaving here, but you don't have to be old to leave here. Now I ask you, are you going to listen to the word of God? Jesus expected those in his day to listen. And if they did not, they would be held accountable. The Lord is calling. You know, Satan is such a liar and such a deceiver. And it is the enemy that wrestles people. And he'll tell you to give your life to Christ later or he'll lie to you and tell you, boy, if you give your life to Christ, you're just giving up life. My Lord, you're going to live in a prison the rest of your life. He's got it backwards. He's, he's lying to you. He knows the truth. But he, he, you, he, you're getting it backwards in your thinking. He's the one that's slowly putting the chains around you. It's Christ who sets you free. Ooh, but the deceitfulness of sin. Be careful, my friend. Just look down a few verses. Now, I can't read this whole chapter, but if you'll just look down uh, to verse 24, I'll pick up there in Matthew 10 where the word says, now Jesus is still teaching. He says, the disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master and the servant as his Lord. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of his household? Fear them not, therefore, for there's nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that speak ye in light. And what ye hear in the ear, that preach ye upon the housetops. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now, if I remember correctly from my studies, the word hell here is Gehenna, and it's speaking of the last place of separation from God. It's not talking about the intermediate state. You die lost. You're immediately separated from the presence of the Lord in a place we might call hell or Hades. But there's a final destination for the lost. And you'll notice here, Jesus said, don't fear men who can only destroy the body, 
He said, fear God, that's who he's talking about, rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Does everybody know today that there is a resurrection in everybody's future? But the Bible says those that are a part of the first resurrection, the second death has no power over them. But even those that are lost have a resurrection. It's a resurrection unto condemnation. And then the lost must appear before the Lord God. John saw this in the future. He describes it in Revelation chapter 20, what we call the great white throne judgment. But the dead, death and hell, the grave, will give up the dead. There's a resurrection. The, the, the immaterial nature, the soul, spirit of the departed lost will be reunited with their resurrected body. But it's a resurrection unto condemnation and they will experience separation from the presence of God where both soul and body is forever separated from the presence of the Lord. Now, this is the Jesus that we worship, we preach, we love, we confess. This is the Lord. There's no higher authority than King Jesus. I get a little weary with those that have preached a few years and they get too big for their britches and they think they know more than King Jesus. You're not the head of the church. If you get too big for your britches, it's time to sit down and let somebody teach you something else for a few days. Christ is the head of the church. What Jesus says is the final authority. Christ says you better fear him who has the authority and power to destroy both soul and body in hell. Do you know that there's people that refuse to come to Christ because they're afraid of their mom? They're afraid of their dad. They're afraid of their buddies at the workplace. Well, what will my friends think of me? Well, what do you care? You're more afraid of those pipsqueaks than you are the living God. So what? You could punch me in the nose. So what? You might be able to do some bodily harm to me. Maybe you could even persecute me unto the death. But my friend, I'll not be afraid of you today. We'll fear God. He's the one who demands our full respect. You need to fear God, not man. And those of you that are afraid to come to Christ for fear of what men will think of you, you need to get over that. You need to get a good revelation of standing before God Almighty one day. God your creator and redeemer in the person of Christ. He loves you today. And it's not his will that you end up in this place. But Jesus Christ says this place is real. And he says you need to fear God who has the power to destroy both soul and body in hell. I'm going to respect him. How about you? I'm going to fear the Lord. I'm not going to worry about men. The fear of men is a great snare. Now, I've got to hurry and I'll try to, if you'll just turn a page over to Matthew chapter 13 and look at verse 36. We're quoting our Savior. These are real warnings. If you listen to the message, they should speak to our heart. Matthew 13, 36. Uh, this is interesting. Jesus has been teaching a great multitude, and he gave them the parable of the sower. And, 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 and after the crowd has dismissed, and, and, and he's able to have some personal time, with his inner circle. Verse 36 says, Then Jesus sent the multitude away, went into the house. And, and, and it says, uh, His disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us the parable of the tares of the field. So they, they get in this intimate setting. Uh, it's been a busy work time. They've interacted with a great multitude, and Jesus has taught for some time. And now it's time to, to have some downtime, you might say. The, there's a setting now where it's not the crowd. It's just Jesus and his 12. And these men are in an intimate setting. Uh, I, I, I got to figure, since they were Christians, they had to be eating. Uh, I, you know, the, the disciples. But anyway, they're in the house. They're getting refreshed. Now they said, would you tell us, Lord, tell us about this parable. So Jesus picks up verse 37. He answered and said to them, he that sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. 
as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world, at the end of this age. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them that do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. He that sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The tares are the children of the wicked. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. Do you realize there's only two groups of people in this whole world? You say, Brother Ross, you got that wrong. There's just so many people. Well, we can't keep up with all the groups. You've got it wrong. There's only two. There's the saved. There's the lost. There are the good seed and there are the tares. Uh, there are those who have the sun and those who do not have the sun. There's not no bunch of groups. You're in two groups. You're traveling one of two roads and you're in one of two groups. Now, the enemy that sowed them is the devil. Satan stands between you and Christ. If he can lie to you and cheat you, he will steal the abundant life Christ has for you. He'll steal your soul. The Bible, seeking whom he may devour. Satan devours through the lie, through deception. Whatever he can use to keep you from coming to Christ, that's what his aim is. He is a murderer. He is destructive. He has no goodwill. He has no feeling of goodwill towards you. He is a deceiver. And if he has his way with you, he will drag you down to hell. Look at this. This is Jesus. The enemy that sold them is the devil. Are you going to let Satan have his way with you? Some of you under the sound of my voice, watching, listening, maybe seated here, you've not yielded your life to Christ. If you've not took heed to the Spirit of God, then you are listening to the wrong voice. At the end, Christ says, when I come, and there's a lot to be said here. There's some things to be taught here, but I just want you to get the big picture. There's a day when Christ says, they won't be entering my kingdom. I'm going to root it out. And them uh, which do iniquity, and it says, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. Is everybody of serious mind today? Are you listening the best you can? Listen to that descriptive language. I've never been in hell, and thank God I'm never going. I don't want to discover exactly what it is. But if the only language King Jesus can use to help us comprehend and understand the horrible reality of the wrath of God, if, if the only language he can use to describe it is a furnace of fire, that ought to make you tremble. I think about how sweet heaven will be. The Lord will be on his throne. And his glory. You see, church, there, there won't be no need of the sun in that city because... He will light that city. But his presence won't be in hell. Nothing but darkness there. The lost around us reap the benefits of a benevolent God on a daily basis, and they rarely stop to thank him. Many even blaspheme his name, and they are so blind. Today, they're reaping benefits from a good God, even in their lost condition. I see a lot of lost people, they eat just as good as I do. Some of them have jobs where they get along pretty good, make a few dollars in this old world. They have good, clean water to drink like I do here in the States and lots of benefits. 
Can you imagine the day when you're separated from all the goodness of God? That's got to be hell. Where there's never a sunrise. Whew. God help us. Jesus said there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There's no comfort there. I'm telling you, what I'm trying to say briefly is the lost have no taste of that place because today, even in their lost condition, they're reaping many benefits from the hand of a good, good Heavenly Father. I warn you today, this place is real. I changed roads 50 years ago. Been traveling the highway home for a long time. And I'm happy about going there. And it would suit my fancy just fine if I went there today. There's nothing holding me here. My treasure's there. My hope's laid up there. My citizenship is there. I'm a foreigner in this world. Just a pilgrim headed for home. I want to go where the Lamb of God is on the throne. I want to go, my friends, where the streets are gold, where the gates are pearl. I want to go where the rainbow surrounds that throne. I want to see the King in all of his glory. I'm on my way home. How about you today? Hey, I'm traveling the road towards heaven, and it would suit me fine if I went there today. There's nothing holding me here. Keeps growing on you, too. The longer you live for King Jesus, the more desire you have to be in his presence. All my treasures there. Man, we got a lot of loved ones there now. I wouldn't mind seeing them again. Going to be some happy reunions. But you know all that heaven holds. There's not one of those blessings. in this place where there's nothing but weeping and gnashing of teeth. I got to share something with you now. You're going to have to be with, patient with me. I'm going to try to finish. The same Savior who talked about heaven, he taught us about hell. But you see, he was teaching about hell and warning people about it even as he was on a journey. Every step from that Bethlehem manger all the way to that present day when he was ministering, it was leading him to a place called Golgotha. I want to read this to you. Matthew 27, verse 31. Christ has been delivered into the hands of wicked men. They've had their way with him. And Matthew 27, 31 says, And after that they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross, Christ had been beaten severely. He bore the stripes in his body and the scourging he had received and left him weak. He could not bear the cross alone. Verse 33, And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him. They drove the nails in his feet. They stretched out his arms and drove the nails into his hands. They lifted him up. They parted his garments. Christ lifted up on the cross, was naked, beaten, his body marred, really beyond recognition. No one has ever suffered like the Lord Jesus, my friend. 
And this is just the physical. This is just the reality of what man could do to him. They cast lots, verse 35, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they, uh, did they cast lots. And setting down, they watched him there and set up over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right hand, the other, another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priest, mocking him with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Now you need to have your bearings here and you need to remember that the sixth hour was high noon. And so we're talking from noon until three o'clock. There was darkness over all the land. This wasn't a cloudy day. It wasn't sunny and then the clouds rolled in off of the Mediterranean. That, that's not what it was. It became dark. This was supernatural. There's something going on here that I pray you can understand. But in these hours on the cross, the Father gave the cup to his son. The cup he agonized over in the garden and said, Father, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The cup was pressed upon his lips and he had to receive it. What did that speak of? Ladies and gentlemen, Christ on the cross became our sin bearer. The great exchange is taking place. It was the godly for the ungodly. It was the innocent for the guilty. It was Christ bearing my sins in his body on the tree. The sun could not shine while the Son of God was made an offering for sin. And there, by the grace of God, he that knew no sin became sin for us. That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There, by the grace of God, he tasted death for every man. Christ died for you. Why? To keep you out of hell. He bore the wrath. He fully propitiated God. His great satisfaction his great sacrifice has fully satisfied the Father. Christ died he paid it all his last cry from the cross was it is finished the work was accomplished Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And three days later, God raised his son from the dead, declaring to this old world that Jesus Christ is my son. He is high and exalted with a name that's above every other name. He's the Savior. The empty tomb is God's promise, declaration to us that the cross is enough. The good news is, you don't have to go to hell. Is everybody still listening? I don't want to lose you. The good news is, you don't have to die. 
and go to a place called hell. You say, preacher, how am I going to escape that place? You have to respond to the Spirit of the Lord. I don't have to try to do the Holy Spirit's work. I know he's speaking the hearts even now. And he's drawing you to Christ. If you will not repent and yield your heart to Christ and confess him with your mouth. See, the Bible says if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Saved? Saved means you're not going to hell. You're going to heaven. And that will cause anybody to try to dance anyway. Amen. Don't you want to have eternal life? Don't you want peace with God? Don't you want to know the Lord? And friend, this is what life is all about. It's not about careers and money and clothes and gadgets and vacations and playtime. All these things are down on the list. God's an awful, he's a good God. He, he gives us all things richly to enjoy, but those things become a stumbling block. Even idols. No, that's not what life is about. Life is about the Lord. It's about knowing him. It's about receiving eternal life. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads for prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for this service today. and Lord, we thank you for your sweet spirit. I know, Lord, you're speaking the hearts. Father, would you help young and old alike in this building? Perhaps there's someone here today who needs to surrender their life to Christ. Lord, you have warned us. There's a broad road. Many are traveling that road. Don't travel that road. You've warned us, Lord. Don't fear men. Fear God who has the power to destroy both soul and body in hell. You've told us, Lord, there's a day coming, Lord, when you will root out all the tares, and, Lord, they'll be gathered, and, Lord, they will find their place in hell. It has been a blessing for us to worship together at this time, and we invite you to come worship with us. CBM is located 3809 Maple Avenue in Castalia, easily accessible from State Route 2. Take Route 2 to State Route 101 South and turn left onto Maple Avenue. We would love to have you visit. And don't forget, it's your prayers and gifts of love that bring this program into your home each week. Send your gifts of support, prayer requests, and comments to CBM, Box 247, Castalia, Ohio, 44824. CBM Worship is a production and presentation of Christian Broadcasting Ministries. CBM, proclaiming the word.